Elizabeth II was Queen of the United Kingdom and other Commonwealth realms from February 6, 1952 until her death in 2022. She was Queen Regnant of 32 sovereign states during her lifetime and 15 at the time of her death. Her reign of 70 years and 214 days was the longest of any British monarch and the longest verified reign of any female monarch in history. Elizabeth was born in Mayfair, London, as the first child of the Duke and Duchess of York. Her father acceded to the throne in 1936 upon the abdication of his brother Edward VIII, making the ten-year-old Princess Elizabeth the heir presumptive. She was educated privately at home and began to undertake public duties during the Second World War, serving in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. In November 1947, she married Philip Mountbatten, a former Prince of Greece and Denmark, and their marriage lasted 73 years until his death in 2021. They had four children, Charles, Anne, Andrew, and Edward. When her father died in February 1952, Elizabeth then 25 years old became Queen of seven independent Commonwealth countries, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Pakistan, and Ceylon, as well as head of the Commonwealth. Elizabeth reigned as a constitutional monarch through major political changes such as the Troubles in Northern Ireland, devolution in the United Kingdom, the decolonization of Africa, and the United Kingdom's accession to the European communities and withdrawal from the European Union. The number of her realms varied over time as territories gained independence and some realms became republics. As Queen, Elizabeth was served by more than 170 prime ministers across her realms. Her many historic visits and meetings included state visits to China in 1986, to Russia in 1994, and to the Republic of Ireland in 2011, and meetings with five popes. Significant events included Elizabeth's coronation in 1953 and the celebrations of her silver, golden, diamond, and platinum jubilees in 1977, 2002, 2012, and 2022, respectively. Although she faced occasional Republican sentiment and media criticism of her family particularly after the breakdowns of her children's marriages, her annus horribilis in 1992, and the death in 1997 of her former daughter-in-law Diana, Princess of Wales' support for the monarchy in the United Kingdom remained consistently high throughout her lifetime, as did her personal popularity. Elizabeth died in 2022 at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire, at the age of 96, and was succeeded by her eldest son, Charles III. Her state funeral was the first to be held in the United Kingdom since that of Winston Churchill in 1965. Early Life Elizabeth was born on April 21, 1926, the first child of Prince Albert, Duke of York, and his wife, Elizabeth, Duchess of York. Her father was the second son of King George V and Queen Mary and her mother was the youngest daughter of Scottish aristocrat Claude Boslyon, 14th Earl of Strathmore and King Horn. She was delivered at 240 by Caesarean section at her maternal grandfather's London home, 17, Bruton Street in Mayfair. The Anglican Archbishop of York, Cosmo Gordon Lang, baptized her in the private chapel of Buckingham Palace on May 29, and she was named Elizabeth after her mother. Alexandra after her paternal great-grandmother, who had died six months earlier, and Mary after her paternal grandmother. She was called Lilibet by her close family, based on what she called herself at first. She was cherished by her grandfather George V, whom she affectionately called Grandpa England, and her regular visits during his serious illness in 1929 were credited in the popular press and by later biographers with raising his spirits and aiding his recovery. Elizabeth's only sibling, Princess Margaret, was born in 1930. The two princesses were educated at home under the supervision of their mother and their governess, Marion Crawford. Lessons concentrated on history, language, literature, and music. 
Crawford published a biography of Elizabeth and Margaret's childhood years entitled The Little Princesses in 1950, much to the dismay of the royal family. The book describes Elizabeth's love of horses and dogs, her orderliness, and her attitude of responsibility. Others echoed such observations, Winston Churchill described Elizabeth when she was two as a character. She has an air of authority and reflectiveness astonishing in an infant. Her cousin Margaret Rhodes described her as a jolly little girl, but fundamentally sensible and well-behaved. Air presumptive. During her grandfather's reign, Elizabeth was third in the line of succession to the British throne, behind her uncle Edward and her father. Although her birth generated public interest, she was not expected to become queen, as Edward was still young and likely to marry and have children of his own, who would precede Elizabeth in the line of succession. When her grandfather died in 1936 and her uncle succeeded as Edward VIII, she became second in line to the throne, after her father. Later that year, Edward abdicated after his proposed marriage to divorced socialite Wallace Simpson provoked a constitutional crisis. Consequently, Elizabeth's father became king, taking the regnal name George VI. Since Elizabeth had no brothers, she became heir presumptive. If her parents had subsequently had a son, he would have been heir apparent and above her in the line of succession which was determined by the male preference primogeniture in effect at the time. Elizabeth received private tuition in constitutional history from Henry Martin, vice provost of Eden College, and learned French from a succession of native-speaking governesses. A Girl Guides Company, the first Buckingham Palace Company, was formed specifically so she could socialize with girls her own age. Later, she was enrolled as a Sea Ranger. In 1939, Elizabeth's parents toured Canada and the United States. As in 1927, when they had toured Australia and New Zealand, Elizabeth remained in Britain, since her father thought she was too young to undertake public tours. She looked tearful as her parents departed. They corresponded regularly and she and her parents made the first Royal Transatlantic Telephone Call on May 18. Second World War In September 1939, Britain entered the Second World War. Lord Hailsham suggested that Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret should be evacuated to Canada to avoid the frequent aerial bombings of London by the Luftwaffe. This was rejected by their mother, who declared, The children won't go without me. I won't leave without the king. And the king will never leave. The princesses stayed at Balmoral Castle, Scotland, until Christmas 1939, when they moved to Sandringham House, Norfolk. From February to May 1940, they lived at Royal Lodge, Windsor, until moving to Windsor Castle, where they lived for most of the next five years. At Windsor, the princesses staged pantomimes at Christmas in aid of the Queen's Wool Fund, which bought yarn to knit into military garments. In 1940, the 14-year-old Elizabeth made her first radio broadcast during the BBC's Children's Hour, addressing other children who had been evacuated from the cities. She stated, We are trying to do all we can to help our gallant sailors, soldiers, and airmen, and we are trying, too to bear our own share of the danger and sadness of war. We know, every one of us, that in the end all will be well. In 1943, Elizabeth undertook her first solo public appearance on a visit to the Grenadier Guards, of which she had been appointed colonel the previous year. As she approached her 18th birthday, Parliament changed the law so she could act as one of five councillors of state in the event of her father's incapacity or absence abroad, such as his visit to Italy in July 1944. In February 1945, she was appointed an honorary second subaltern in the Auxiliary Territorial Service with the service number of 230,873. She trained and worked as a driver and mechanic and was given the rank of honorary junior commander five months later. At the end of the war in Europe, 
on Victory in Europe Day, Elizabeth and Margaret mingled incognito with the celebrating crowds in the streets of London. Elizabeth later said in a rare interview, We asked my parents if we could go out and see for ourselves. I remember we were terrified of being recognized. I remember lines of unknown people linking arms and walking down Whitehall, all of us just swept along on a tide of happiness and relief. During the war, plans were drawn up to quell Welsh nationalism by affiliating Elizabeth more closely with Wales. Proposals, such as appointing her constable of Caernarfon Castle or a patron of Erdgabaith Simru, were abandoned for several reasons, including fear of associating Elizabeth with conscientious objectors in the Erd at a time when Britain was at war. Welsh politicians suggested she be made Princess of Wales on her 18th birthday. Home Secretary Herbert Morrison supported the idea, but the king rejected it because he felt such a title belonged solely to the wife of a Prince of Wales and the Prince of Wales had always been the heir apparent. In 1946, she was inducted into the Gorset of Bards at the National Estethvad of Wales. Princess Elizabeth went on her first overseas tour in 1947, accompanying her parents through southern Africa. During the tour, in a broadcast to the British Commonwealth on her 21st birthday, she made the following pledge, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. The oft-quoted speech was written by Dermot Mora, a journalist for the Times. Marriage Elizabeth met her future husband, Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark, in 1934 and again in 1937. They were second cousins once removed through King Christian IX of Denmark and third cousins through Queen Victoria. After meeting for the third time at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth in July 1939, Elizabeth though only 13 years old said she fell in love with Philip, who was 18, and they began to exchange letters. She was 21 when their engagement was officially announced on July 9, 1947. The engagement attracted some controversy. Philip had no financial standing, was foreign born, and had sisters who had married German noblemen with Nazi links. Marion Crawford wrote, Some of the king's advisers did not think him good enough for her. He was a prince without a home or kingdom. Some of the papers played long and loud tunes on the string of Philip's foreign origin. Later biographies reported that Elizabeth's mother had reservations about the union initially, and teased Philip as the Hun. In later life, however, she told the biographer Tim Heald that Philip was an English gentleman. Before the marriage, Philip renounced his Greek and Danish titles, officially converted from Greek Orthodoxy to Anglicanism, and adopted the style Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, taking the surname of his mother's British family. Shortly before the wedding, he was created Duke of Edinburgh and granted the style His Royal Highness. Elizabeth and Philip were married on November 20, 1947 at Westminster Abbey. They received 2,500 wedding gifts from around the world. Elizabeth required ration coupons to buy the material for her gown because Britain had not yet completely recovered from the devastation of the war. In post-war Britain, it was not acceptable for Philip's German relations, including his three surviving sisters, to be invited to the wedding. Neither was an invitation extended to the Duke of Windsor, formerly King Edward VIII. Elizabeth gave birth to her first child, Charles on November 14, 1948. One month earlier, the king had issued letters patent allowing her children to use the style and title of a royal prince or princess, to which they otherwise would not have been entitled as their father was no longer a royal prince. A second child, Princess Anne, was born on August 15, 1950. Following their wedding, the couple leased Windlesham Moor, near Windsor Castle, until July 1949, when they took up residence at Clarence House in London. At various times between 1949 and 1951, 
the Duke of Edinburgh was stationed in the British Crown Colony of Malta as a serving Royal Navy officer. He and Elizabeth lived intermittently in Malta for several months at a time in the hamlet of Guardamana, at Villa Guardamanja, the rented home of Philip's uncle, Lord Mountbatten. Their two children remained in Britain. Reign Accession and Coronation George VI's health declined during 1951, and Elizabeth frequently stood in for him at public events. When she toured Canada and visited President Harry S. Truman in Washington, D.C., in October 1951, her private secretary, Martin Charteris, carried a draft accession declaration in case of the King's death while she was on tour. In early 1952, Elizabeth and Philip set out for a tour of Australia and New Zealand by way of the British colony of Kenya. On February 6, 1952, they had just returned to their Kenyan home, Sagana Lodge, after a night spent at Treetops Hotel, when word arrived of the death of George VI and Elizabeth's consequent accession to the throne with immediate effect. Philip broke the news to the new queen. She chose to retain Elizabeth as her regnal name, thus she was called Elizabeth II, which offended many Scots, as she was the first Elizabeth to rule in Scotland. She was proclaimed queen throughout her realms and the royal party hastily returned to the United Kingdom. Elizabeth and Philip moved into Buckingham Palace. With Elizabeth's accession, it seemed probable that the royal house would bear the Duke of Edinburgh's name in line with the custom of a wife taking her husband's surname on marriage. Lord Mountbatten advocated the name House of Mountbatten. Philip suggested House of Edinburgh, after his ducal title. The British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and Elizabeth's grandmother Queen Mary favoured the retention of the House of Windsor, so Elizabeth issued a declaration on April 9, 1952 that Windsor would continue to be the name of the royal house. Philip complained, I am the only man in the country not allowed to give his name to his own children. In 1960, the surname Mountbatten Windsor was adopted for Philip and Elizabeth's male line descendants who do not carry royal titles. Amid preparations for the coronation, Princess Margaret told her sister she wished to marry Peter Townsend, a divorce 16 years Margaret's senior with two sons from his previous marriage. Elizabeth asked them to wait for a year, in the words of her private secretary, the Queen was naturally sympathetic towards the Princess, but I think she thought she hoped given time, the affair would peter out. Senior politicians were against the match and the Church of England did not permit remarriage after divorce. If Margaret had contracted a civil marriage, she would have been expected to renounce her right of succession. Margaret decided to abandon her plans with Townsend. Despite the death of Queen Mary on March 24, 1953, the coronation went ahead as planned on June 2, as Mary had requested before she died. The coronation ceremony in Westminster Abbey, with the exception of the anointing and communion, was televised for the first time. On Elizabeth's instruction, her coronation gown was embroidered with the floral emblems of Commonwealth countries. Continuing Evolution of the Commonwealth From Elizabeth's birth onwards, the British Empire continued its transformation into the Commonwealth of Nations. By the time of her accession in 1952, her role as head of multiple independent states was already established. In 1953, Elizabeth and her husband embarked on a seven-month round-the-world tour, visiting 13 countries and covering more than 40,000 miles by land, sea, and air. She became the first reigning monarch of Australia and New Zealand to visit those nations. During the tour, crowds were immense, three-quarters of the population of Australia were estimated to have seen her. Throughout her reign, Elizabeth made hundreds of state visits to other countries and tours of the Commonwealth, she was the most widely travelled head of state. In 1956, the British and French Prime Ministers, Sir Anthony Eden and Guy Mollet, discussed the possibility of France joining the Commonwealth. The proposal was never accepted and the following year France signed the Treaty of Rome, 
which established the European Economic Community, the precursor to the European Union. In November 1956, Britain and France invaded Egypt in an ultimately unsuccessful attempt to capture the Suez Canal. Lord Mountbatten said Elizabeth was opposed to the invasion, though Eden denied it. Eden resigned two months later. The absence of a formal mechanism within the Conservative Party for choosing a leader meant that, following Eden's resignation, it fell to Elizabeth to decide whom to commission to form a government. Eden recommended she consult Lord Salisbury, the Lord President of the Council. Lord Salisbury and Lord Kilmuir, the Lord Chancellor, consulted the British Cabinet, Churchill and the Chairman of the Backbench 1922 Committee, resulting in Elizabeth appointing their recommended candidate, Harold Macmillan. The Suez Crisis and the choice of Eden's successor led, in 1957, to the first major personal criticism of Elizabeth. In a magazine, which he owned and edited, Lord Altrincham accused her of being out of touch. Altrincham was denounced by public figures and slapped by a member of the public appalled by his comments. Six years later, in 1963, Macmillan resigned and advised Elizabeth to appoint the Earl of Home as the Prime Minister, advice she followed. Elizabeth again came under criticism for appointing the Prime Minister on the advice of a small number of ministers or a single minister. In 1965, the Conservatives adopted a formal mechanism for electing a leader, thus relieving the Queen of her involvement. In 1957, Elizabeth made a state visit to the United States, where she addressed the United Nations General Assembly on behalf of the Commonwealth. On the same tour, she opened the 23rd Canadian Parliament, becoming the first monarch of Canada to open a parliamentary session. Two years later, solely in her capacity as Queen of Canada, she revisited the United States and toured Canada. In 1961, she toured Cyprus, India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Iran. On a visit to Ghana the same year, she dismissed fears for her safety, even though her host, President Kwame Nkrumah, who had replaced her as head of state, was a target for assassins. Harold Macmillan wrote, The Queen has been absolutely determined all through. She is impatient of the attitude towards her to treat her as a film star. She has indeed the heart and stomach of a man. She loves her duty and means to be a queen. Before her tour through parts of Quebec in 1964, the press reported extremists within the Quebec separatist movement were plotting Elizabeth's assassination. No attempt was made, but a riot did break out while she was in Montreal. Elizabeth's calmness and courage in the face of the violence was noted. Elizabeth gave birth to her third child. Prince Andrew, on February 19, 1960, which was the first birth to a reigning British monarch since 1857. Her fourth child, Prince Edward, was born on March 10, 1964. In addition to performing traditional ceremonies, Elizabeth also instituted new practices. Her first royal walkabout, meeting ordinary members of the public, took place during a tour of Australia and New Zealand in 1970. Acceleration of Decolonization The 1960s and 1970s saw an acceleration in the decolonization of Africa and the Caribbean. More than 20 countries gained independence from Britain as part of a planned transition to self-government. In 1965, however, the Rhodesian Prime Minister, Ian Smith, in opposition to moves towards majority rule, unilaterally declared independence while expressing loyalty and devotion to Elizabeth, declaring her Queen of Rhodesia. Although Elizabeth formally dismissed him, and the international community applied sanctions against Rhodesia, his regime survived for over a decade. As Britain's ties to its former empire weakened, the British government sought entry to the European community, a goal it achieved in 1973. Elizabeth toured Yugoslavia in October 1972, becoming the first British monarch to visit a communist country. 
she was received at the airport by President Joseph Bras Tito, and a crowd of thousands greeted her in Belgrade. In February 1974, the British Prime Minister, Edward Heath, advised Elizabeth to call a general election in the middle of her tour of the Austronesian Pacific Rim, requiring her to fly back to Britain. The election resulted in a hung parliament, Heath's conservatives were not the largest party, but could stay in office if they formed a coalition with the Liberals. When discussions on forming a coalition foundered, Heath resigned as Prime Minister and Elizabeth asked the leader of the opposition, Labour's Harold Wilson, to form a government. A year later, at the height of the 1975 Australian constitutional crisis, the Australian Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, was dismissed from his post by Governor General Sir John Kerr, after the opposition controlled Senate rejected Whitlam's budget proposals. As Whitlam had a majority in the House of Representatives, Speaker Gordon Scholes appealed to Elizabeth to reverse Kerr's decision. She declined, saying she would not interfere in decisions reserved by the Constitution of Australia for the Governor General. The crisis fueled Australian republicanism. Silver Jubilee In 1977, Elizabeth marked the Silver Jubilee of her accession. Parties and events took place throughout the Commonwealth, many coinciding with her associated national and Commonwealth tours. The celebrations reaffirmed Elizabeth's popularity, despite virtually coincident negative press coverage of Princess Margaret's separation from her husband, Lord Snowden. In 1978, Elizabeth endured a state visit to the United Kingdom by Romania's communist leader, Nicolae Sosco, and his wife, Elena, though privately she thought they had blood on their hands. The following year brought two blows, one was the unmasking of Anthony Blunt, former surveyor of the Queen's pictures, as a communist spy, the other was the assassination of her relative and in-law Lord Mountbatten by the Provisional Irish Republican Army. According to Paul Martin Sr., by the end of the 1970s Elizabeth was worried the Crown had little meaning for Pierre Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister. Tony Benn said Elizabeth found Trudeau rather disappointing. Trudeau's supposed republicanism seemed to be confirmed by his antics, such as sliding down banisters at Buckingham Palace and pirouetting behind Elizabeth's back in 1977, and the removal of various Canadian royal symbols during his term of office. In 1980, Canadian politicians sent to London to discuss the patriation of the Canadian Constitution found Elizabeth better informed than any of the British politicians or bureaucrats. She was particularly interested after the failure of Bill C-60, which would have affected her role as head of state. Press Scrutiny and Thatcher Premiership During the 1981 Trooping the Colour Ceremony, six weeks before the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer, six shots were fired at Elizabeth from close range as she rode down the Mall, London, on her horse, Burmese. Police later discovered the shots were blanks. The 17-year-old assailant, Marcus Sargent, was sentenced to five years in prison and released after three. Elizabeth's composure and skill in controlling her mount were widely praised. That October Elizabeth was the subject of another attack while on a visit to Dunedin, New Zealand. Christopher John Lewis, who was 17 years old, fired a shot with a .22 rifle from the fifth floor of a building overlooking the parade, but missed. Lewis was arrested, but never charged with attempted murder or treason, and sentenced to three years in jail for unlawful possession and discharge of a firearm. Two years into his sentence, he attempted to escape a psychiatric hospital with the intention of assassinating Charles, who was visiting the country with Diana and their son Prince William. From April to September 1982, Elizabeth's son, Prince Andrew, served with British forces in the Falklands War, for which she reportedly felt anxiety and pride. On July 9, she awoke in her bedroom at Buckingham Palace to find an intruder, Michael Fagan, in the room with her. In a serious lapse of security, 
assistance only arrived after two calls to the palace police switchboard. After hosting U.S. President Ronald Reagan at Windsor Castle in 1982 and visiting his California ranch in 1983, Elizabeth was angered when his administration ordered the invasion of Grenada, one of her Caribbean realms, without informing her. Intense media interest in the opinions and private lives of the royal family during the 1980s led to a series of sensational stories in the press, pioneered by the Sun tabloid. As Kelvin McKenzie, editor of The Sun, told his staff, give me a Sunday for Monday splash on the royals. Don't worry if it's not true so long as there's not too much of a fuss about it afterwards. Newspaper editor Donald Trollford wrote in The Observer of September 21, 1986, the royal soap opera has now reached such a pitch of public interest that the boundary between fact and fiction has been lost sight of. It is not just that some papers don't check their facts or accept denials, they don't care if the stories are true or not. It was reported, most notably in the Sunday Times of July 20, 1986, that Elizabeth was worried that Margaret Thatcher's economic policies fostered social divisions and was alarmed by high unemployment, a series of riots, the violence of a miners' strike and Thatcher's refusal to apply sanctions against the apartheid regime in South Africa. The sources of the rumors included royal aide Michael Shea and Commonwealth Secretary General Shredath Ramphal, but Shea claimed his remarks were taken out of context and embellished by speculation. Thatcher reputedly said Elizabeth would vote for the Social Democratic Party Thatcher's political opponents. Thatcher's biographer, John Campbell, claimed the report was a piece of journalistic mischief-making. Reports of acrimony between them were exaggerated, and Elizabeth gave two honors in her personal gift membership in the Order of Merit and the Order of the Garter to Thatcher after her replacement as Prime Minister by John Major. Brian Mulroney, Canadian Prime Minister between 1984 and 1993, said Elizabeth was a behind-the-scenes force in ending apartheid. In 1986, Elizabeth paid a six-day state visit to the People's Republic of China, becoming the first British monarch to visit the country. The tour included the Forbidden City, the Great Wall of China, and the Terracotta Warriors. At a state banquet, Elizabeth joked about the first British emissary to China being lost at sea with Queen Elizabeth I's letter to the Wan Li Emperor, and remarked, Fortunately postal services have improved since 1602. Elizabeth's visit also signified the acceptance of both countries that sovereignty over Hong Kong would be transferred from the United Kingdom to China in 1997. By the end of the 1980s, Elizabeth had become the target of satire. The involvement of younger members of the royal family in the charity game show It's a Royal Knockout in 1987 was ridiculed. In Canada, Elizabeth publicly supported politically divisive constitutional amendments, prompting criticism from opponents of the proposed changes, including Pierre Trudeau. The same year, the elected Fijian government was deposed in a military coup. As monarch of Fiji, Elizabeth supported the attempts of Governor-General Ratu Serpina Aganalo to assert executive power and negotiate a settlement. Coup leader Sitavini Rabuka deposed Ganalo and declared Fiji a republic. Turbulent 1990s and Dianus Horribilis slash I. None. Golden Jubilee. On the eve of the new millennium, Elizabeth and Philip boarded a vessel from Southwark, bound for the Millennium Dome. Before passing under Tower Bridge, Elizabeth lit the National Millennium Beacon in the Pool of London using a laser torch. Shortly before midnight, she officially opened the dome. During the singing of Auld Lang Syne, Elizabeth held hands with Philip and British Prime Minister Tony Blair. In 2002, Elizabeth marked her Golden Jubilee, the 50th anniversary of her accession. Her sister and mother died in February and March respectively, and the media speculated on whether the Jubilee would be a success or a failure. She again undertook an extensive tour of her realms, beginning in Jamaica in February, where she called the farewell banquet memorable after a power cut plunged the king's house, 
the official residence of the Governor General, into darkness. As in 1977, there were street parties and commemorative events, and monuments were named to honor the occasion. One million people attended each day of the three-day main jubilee celebration in London, and the enthusiasm shown for Elizabeth by the public was greater than many journalists had anticipated. In 2003, Elizabeth sued Daily Mirror for breach of confidence and obtained an injunction which prevented the outlet from publishing information gathered by a reporter who posed as a footman at Buckingham Palace. The newspaper also paid £25,000 towards her legal costs. Though generally healthy throughout her life, in 2003 Elizabeth had keyhole surgery on both knees. In October 2006, she missed the opening of the new Emirates Stadium because of a strained back muscle that had been troubling her since the summer. In May 2007, citing unnamed sources, the Daily Telegraph reported that Elizabeth was exasperated and frustrated by the policies of Tony Blair, that she was concerned the British armed forces were overstretched in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that she had raised concerns over rural and countryside issues with Blair. She was, however, said to admire Blair's efforts to achieve peace in Northern Ireland. She became the first British monarch to celebrate a diamond wedding anniversary in November 2007. On March 20, 2008, at the Church of Ireland Street Patrick's Cathedral, Armagh, Elizabeth attended the first Mondas service held outside England and Wales. Elizabeth addressed the UN General Assembly for a second time in 2010, again in her capacity as Queen of all Commonwealth realms and head of the Commonwealth. The UN Secretary-General, Ban Ki-moon, introduced her as an anchor for our age. During her visit to New York, which followed a tour of Canada, she officially opened a memorial garden for British victims of the September 11 attacks. Elizabeth's 11-day visit to Australia in October 2011 was her 16th visit to the country since 1954. By invitation of the Irish President, Mary McAleese, she made the first state visit to the Republic of Ireland by a British monarch in May 2011. Diamond Jubilee and Longevity Elizabeth's 2012 Diamond Jubilee marks 60 years on the throne, and celebrations were held throughout her realms, the wider Commonwealth, and beyond. She and her husband undertook an extensive tour of the United Kingdom while her children and grandchildren embarked on royal tours of other Commonwealth states on her behalf. On June 4, Jubilee beacons were lit around the world. In November, Elizabeth and her husband celebrated their Blue Sapphire wedding anniversary. On December 18, she became the first British sovereign to attend a peacetime cabinet meeting since George III in 1781. Elizabeth who opened the 1976 Summer Olympics in Montreal, also opened the 2012 Summer Olympics and Paralympics in London, making her the first head of state to open two Olympic Games in two countries. For the London Olympics, she played herself in a short film as part of the opening ceremony, alongside Daniel Craig as James Bond. On April 4, 2013, she received an honorary BAFTA for her patronage of the film industry and was called the most memorable Bond girl yet at the award ceremony. On March 3, 2013, Elizabeth stayed overnight at King Edward VII's hospital as a precaution after developing symptoms of gastroenteritis. A week later, she signed the new Charter of the Commonwealth. Because of her age and the need for her to limit traveling, in 2013 she chose not to attend the Biennial Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting for the first time in 40 years. She was represented at the summit in Sri Lanka by Prince Charles. On April 20, 2018, the Commonwealth Heads of Government announced that she would be succeeded by Charles as head of the Commonwealth, which she stated was her sincere wish. She underwent cataract surgery in May 2018. In March 2019, she gave up driving on public roads, 
largely as a consequence of a car crash involving her husband two months earlier. Elizabeth surpassed her great great grandmother, Queen Victoria, to become the longest lived British monarch on December 21, 2007, and the longest reigning British monarch and longest reigning queen regnant and female head of state in the world on September 9, 2015. She became the oldest current monarch after King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia died on January 23, 2015. She later became the longest reigning current monarch and the longest serving current head of state following the death of King Bhumibol of Thailand on October 13, 2016, and the oldest current head of state on the resignation of Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe on November 21, 2017. On February 6, 2017, she became the first British monarch to commemorate a Sapphire Jubilee, and on November 20, she was the first British monarch to celebrate a platinum wedding anniversary. Philip had retired from his official duties as the Queen's consort in August 2017. COVID-19 Pandemic On March 19, 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic hit the United Kingdom, Elizabeth moved to Windsor Castle and sequestered there as a precaution. Public engagements were cancelled and Windsor Castle followed a strict sanitary protocol nicknamed HMS Bubble. On April 5, in a televised broadcast watched by an estimated 24 million viewers in the UK, she asked people to take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return we will be with our friends again, we will be with our families again, we will meet again. On May 8, the 75th anniversary of VE Day, in a television broadcast at 9 p.m. the exact time at which her father George VI had broadcast to the nation on the same day in 1945 she asked people to never give up, never despair. In October, she visited the UK's Defence Science and Technology Laboratory in Wiltshire her first public engagement since the start of the pandemic. On November 4, she appeared masked for the first time in public, during a private pilgrimage to the tomb of the unknown warrior at Westminster Abbey, to mark the centenary of his burial. In 2021, she received her first and second COVID-19 vaccinations in January and April respectively. Prince Philip died on April 9, 2021 after 73 years of marriage, making Elizabeth the first British monarch to reign as a widow or widower since Queen Victoria. She was reportedly at her husband's bedside when he died, and remarked in private that his death had left a huge void. Due to the COVID-19 restrictions in place in England at the time, Elizabeth sat alone at Philip's funeral service, which evoked sympathy from people around the world. In her Christmas broadcast that year, she paid a personal tribute to her beloved Philip, saying, that mischievous, inquiring twinkle was as bright at the end as when I first set eyes on him. Despite the pandemic, Elizabeth attended the 2021 state opening of Parliament in May, and the 47th G7 summit in June. On July 5, the 73rd anniversary of the founding of the UK's National Health Service, she announced that the NHS will be awarded the George Cross to recognize all NHS staff, past and present, across all disciplines and all four nations. In October 2021, she began using a walking stick during public engagements for the first time since her operation in 2004. Following an overnight stay in hospital on October 20, her previously scheduled visits to Northern Ireland, the 26 Colombian Pesos Summit in Glasgow, and the 2021 National Service of Remembrance were cancelled on health grounds. Platinum Jubilee Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee began on February 6, 2022, marking 70 years since she acceded to the throne on her father's death. On the eve of the date, she held a reception at Sandringham House for pensioners, local women's institute members and charity volunteers. In her Accession Day message, Elizabeth renewed her commitment to a lifetime of public service, which she had originally made in 1947. Later that month, 
Elizabeth had mild cold-like symptoms and tested positive for COVID-19, along with some staff and family members. She cancelled two virtual audiences on February 22, but held a phone conversation with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson the following day amid a crisis on the Russo-Ukrainian border, following which she made a donation to the Disasters Emergency Committee Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal. On February 28, she was reported to have recovered and spent time with her family at Frogmore. On March 7, Elizabeth met Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at Windsor Castle, in her first in-person engagement since her COVID diagnosis. She later remarked that COVID infection leave one very tired and exhausted. It's not a nice result. Elizabeth was present at the service of Thanksgiving for Prince Philip at Westminster Abbey on March 29, but was unable to attend the annual Commonwealth Day service that month or the Royal Monda service in April. She missed the state opening of Parliament in May for the first time in 59 years. In her absence, Parliament was opened by the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Cambridge as councillors of state. During the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, Elizabeth was largely confined to balcony appearances, and missed the national service of Thanksgiving. For the Jubilee concert, she took part in a sketch with Paddington Bear, that opened the event outside Buckingham Palace. On June 13, 2022, she became the second longest reigning monarch in history among those whose exact dates of reign are known, with 70 years. 127 days reign surpassing King Bumibal Adol Yadej of Thailand. On September 6, 2022, she appointed her 15th British Prime Minister, Liz Truss, at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. This marked the only time she did not receive a new Prime Minister at Buckingham Palace during her reign. No other British reign had seen so many Prime Ministers. Elizabeth never planned to abdicate though she took on fewer public engagements as she grew older and Prince Charles took on more of her duties. The Queen told Canadian Governor General Adrian Clarkson in a meeting in 2002 that she would never abdicate, saying it is not our tradition. Although, I suppose if I became completely gaga, one would have to do something. In June 2022, Elizabeth met the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who came away thinking there is someone who has no fear of death, has hope in the future, knows the rock on which she stands and that gives her strength. Death On September 8, 2022, Buckingham Palace released a statement which read, Following further evaluation this morning, the Queen's doctors are concerned for Her Majesty's health and have recommended she remain under medical supervision. The Queen remains comfortable and at Balmoral. Elizabeth's immediate family rushed to Balmoral to be by her side. She died peacefully at 1510 BST at the age of 96, with two of her children, Charles and Anne by her side. Her death was announced to the public at 1830, setting in motion Operation London Bridge End, because she died in Scotland, Operation Unicorn. Elizabeth was the first monarch to die in Scotland since James V in 1542. Her cause of death was recorded as old age. On September 12, Elizabeth's coffin was carried up the Royal Mile in a procession to St Giles Cathedral, where the Crown of Scotland was placed on it. Her coffin lay at rest at the cathedral for 24 hours, guarded by the Royal Company of Archers during which around 33,000 people filed past the coffin. It was taken by air to London on September 13. On September 14, her coffin was taken in a military procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall, where Elizabeth lay in state for four days. The coffin was guarded by members of both the Sovereign's Bodyguard and the Household Division. An estimated 250,000 members of the public filed past the coffin, as did politicians and other public figures. On September 16, Elizabeth's children held a vigil around her coffin, and the next day her eight grandchildren did the same. Elizabeth's state funeral was held at Westminster Abbey on September 19, 
which marked the first time that a monarch's funeral service had been held at the Abbey since George II in 1760. More than a million people lined the streets of central London, and the day was declared a holiday in several Commonwealth countries. In Windsor, a final procession involving 1,000 military personnel took place which was witnessed by 97,000 people. Elizabeth's fell pony, and two royal corgis, stood at the site of the procession. After a committal service at St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, Elizabeth was interred with her husband Philip in the King George VI Memorial Chapel later the same day in a private ceremony attended by her closest family members. Legacy Beliefs, Activities, and Interests Elizabeth rarely gave interviews and little was known of her personal feelings. She did not explicitly express her own political opinions in a public forum, and it is against convention to ask or reveal the monarch's views. When Times journalist Paul Routledge asked Elizabeth for her opinions on the miners' strike of 1984-85, she replied that it was all about one man, with which Routledge disagreed. Widely criticized in the media for asking the question, Routledge said he was not initially due to be present for the royal visit and was unaware of the protocols. After the 2014 Scottish independence referendum, Prime Minister David Cameron stated that Elizabeth was pleased with the outcome. She had arguably issued a public coded statement about the referendum by telling one woman outside Balmoral Kirk that she hoped people would think very carefully about the outcome. It emerged later that Cameron had specifically requested that she register her concern. Elizabeth had a deep sense of religious and civic duty, and took her coronation oath seriously. Aside from her official religious role as Supreme Governor of the Established Church of England, she worshipped with that church and also the National Church of Scotland. She demonstrated support for interfaith relations and met with leaders of other churches and religions, including five popes, Pius XII, John XXIII, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis. A personal note about her faith often featured in her annual Christmas message broadcast to the Commonwealth. In 2000, she said, To many of us, our beliefs are of fundamental importance. For me the teachings of Christ and my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to lead my life. I, like so many of you, have drawn great comfort in difficult times from Christ's words and example. Elizabeth was patron of more than 600 organizations and charities. The Charities Aid Foundation estimated that Elizabeth helped raise over £1.4 billion for her patronages during her reign. Her main leisure interests included equestrianism and dogs, especially her Pembroke Welsh corgis. Her lifelong love of corgis began in 1933 with Dukey, the first corgi owned by her family. Scenes of a relaxed, informal home life were occasionally witnessed, she and her family, from time to time, prepared a meal together and washed the dishes afterwards. Media Depiction and Public Opinion In the 1950s, as a young woman at the start of her reign, Elizabeth was depicted as a glamorous fairy tale queen. After the trauma of the Second World War, it was a time of hope a period of progress and achievement heralding a new Elizabethan age. Lord Altran James' accusation in 1957 that her speeches sounded like those of a priggish schoolgirl was an extremely rare criticism. In the late 1960s, attempts to portray a more modern image of the monarchy were made in the television documentary Royal Family and by televising Prince Charles's investiture as Prince of Wales. Her wardrobe developed a recognizable, signature style driven more by function than fashion. In public, she took to wearing mostly solid color overcoats and decorative hats, allowing her to be seen easily in a crowd. At Elizabeth's Silver Jubilee in 1977, the crowds and celebrations were genuinely enthusiastic, but, in the 1980s, public criticism of the royal family increased as the personal and working lives of Elizabeth's children came under media scrutiny. 
her popularity sank to a low point in the 1990s. Under pressure from public opinion, she began to pay income tax for the first time, and Buckingham Palace was opened to the public. Although support for republicanism in Britain seemed higher than at any time in living memory, republican ideology was still a minority viewpoint and Elizabeth herself had high approval ratings. Criticism was focused on the institution of the monarchy itself, and the conduct of Elizabeth's wider family, rather than her own behavior and actions. Discontent with the monarchy reached its peak on the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, although Elizabeth's personal popularity as well as general support for the monarchy rebounded after her live television broadcast to the world five days after Diana's death. In November 1999, a referendum in Australia on the future of the Australian monarchy favoured its retention in preference to an indirectly elected head of state. Many Republicans credited Elizabeth's personal popularity with the survival of the monarchy in Australia. In 2010, Prime Minister Julia Gillard noted that there was a deep affection for Elizabeth in Australia and another referendum on the monarchy should wait until after her reign. Gillard's successor, Malcolm Turnbull, who led the Republican campaign in 1999, similarly believed that Australians would not vote to become a republic in her lifetime. She's been an extraordinary head of state, Turnbull said in 2021, and I think frankly, in Australia, there are more Elizabethans than there are monarchists. Similarly, Referendums in both Tuvalu in 2008 and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Indiana 2009 saw voters reject proposals to become republics. Polls in Britain in 2006 and 2007 revealed strong support for the monarchy, and in 2012, Elizabeth's Diamond Jubilee year, her approval ratings hit 90 per center. Her family came under scrutiny again in the last few years of her life due to her son Andrew's association with convicted sex offenders Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, his lawsuit with Virginia Jufrey amidst accusations of sexual impropriety, and her grandson Harry and his wife Meghan's exit from the monarchy and subsequent move to the United States. Polling in Great Britain during the Platinum Jubilee, however, showed Elizabeth's personal popularity remained strong. As of 2021 she remained the third most admired woman in the world according to the annual Gallup poll, her 52 appearances on the list meaning she had been in the top 10 more than any other woman in the poll's history. Elizabeth was portrayed in a variety of media by many notable artists, including painters Pietro Anigoni, Peter Blake, Chinwee Chikwago Roy, Terence Cuneo, Lucian Freud, Rolf Harris, Damien Hirst, Juliet Panette, and Taishan Schirenberg. Notable photographers of Elizabeth included Cecil Beaton, Yusef Karsh, Anwar Hussein, Annie Leibovitz, Lord Litchfield, Terry O'Neill, John Swanell, and Dorothy Wilding. The first official portrait photograph of Elizabeth was taken by Marcus Adams in 1926. Finances Elizabeth's personal wealth was the subject of speculation for many years. In 1971, Jock Colville, her former private secretary and a director of her bank, Coutts, estimated her wealth at £2 million. In 1993, Buckingham Palace called estimates of £100 million grossly overstated. In 2002, she inherited an estate worth an estimated £70 million from her mother. The Sunday Times Rich List 2020 estimated her personal wealth at £350 million, making her the 372nd richest person in the UK. She was number one on the list when it began in the Sunday Times Rich List 1989, with a reported wealth of £5.2 billion, which included state assets that were not hers personally. The Royal Collection, which includes thousands of historic works of art and the crown jewels, was not owned personally but was described as being held in trust by Elizabeth for her successors and the nation, as were her official residences such as Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle, and the Duchy of Lancaster, a property portfolio valued at £472 million in 2015. 
The Paradise Papers, leaked in 2017, show that the Duchy of Lancaster held investments in the British tax havens of the Cayman Islands and Bermuda. Sandringham House in Norfolk and Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire were personally owned by Elizabeth. The Crown Estate with holdings of £14.3 billion in 2019 is held in trust and could not be sold or owned by her in a personal capacity. Titles, Styles, Honours and Arms Titles and Styles April 21, 1926 – December 11, 1936 her Royal Highness Princess Elizabeth of York. December 11, 1936 – November 20, 1947, Her Royal Highness the Princess Elizabeth. November 20, 1947 – February 6, 1952, Her Royal Highness the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh. February 6, 1952 – September 8, 2022, her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth held many titles and honorary military positions throughout the Commonwealth, was sovereign of many orders in her own countries, and received honours and awards from around the world. In each of her realms, she had a distinct title that follows a similar formula, Queen of St. Lucia and of her other realms and territories in St. Lucia, Queen of Australia and her other realms and territories in Australia, etc. In the Channel Islands and Isle of Man, which are crown dependencies rather than separate realms, she was known as Duke of Normandy and Lord of Man, respectively. Additional styles include Defender of the Faith and Duke of Lancaster. When conversing with Elizabeth, the correct etiquette was to address her initially as Your Majesty and thereafter as Ma'am, with a short A as in Jam. Arms from April 21, 1944 until her accession, Elizabeth's arms consisted of a lozenge bearing the royal coat of arms of the United Kingdom differenced with a label of three points argent, the center point bearing a Tudor rose and the first and third a cross of St. George. Upon her accession, she inherited the various arms her father held as sovereign. Elizabeth also possessed royal standards and personal flags for use in the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica, and elsewhere. Issue Ancestry See also Household of Elizabeth II List of things named after Elizabeth II List of jubilees of Elizabeth II List of special addresses made by Elizabeth II Royal eponyms in Canada Royal Descendants of Queen Victoria and of King Christian IX Notes